With the success of the first two Wing Commander games, Electronic Arts turned their attention to Origin Systems. They acquired the studio, and that in turn gave them the resources to create Wing Commander 3, Heart of the Tiger. This game was released in 1994. In Wing Commander 1, you're a rookie pilot on the TCS Tiger's Claw. In Wing Commander 2, you're brought on board the TCS Concordia. Both of these games allowed you to enter your name, but in Wing Commander 3, one is finally given to your character. You are Colonel Christopher Blair assigned to the TCS Victory. Welcome to the TCS Victory, Colonel. Thank you, Captain. Better known as Tin Can Sally. This game continues the Kilrothi saga, the war between humanity and the feline race known as the Kilrothi. The stakes are much higher this time around. Win the war against the Kilrothi or lose planet Earth and all of humanity along with it. The mission tree system makes its return in a more simplified format, but there is still a meaningful amount of divergence. Once again, your skills as a pilot will determine the outcome, but this game adds so much more to the series. Wing Commander 3 maintains the same complex formula of the previous games. It's a space combat simulator. There are many complex systems you have to switch to frequently, but this is much more simplified when compared to the previous games. Navigation and targeting is always active, but switching to communications, damage control, and weapon systems is still a frequent task. You also have multiple guns and missiles, and switching systems and weapons quickly is essential to the mission and your survival. The hit detection is very tight, so you need to be scoring direct hits to the target, not simply aiming at the red box in front of you. The new addition to the targeting system helps with this. When you lock onto a target, the ITTS kicks in. This is the green circle that allows you to put down accurate fire at a fast-moving target. Despite that, scoring a hit is still a difficult task to master, but it's very rewarding when you take the kill. Communication is now a much bigger part of the game. Taunting the enemies and issuing orders to your wingmen help you control the battle much more than before. Sometimes it's more beneficial to keep your wingmen on your wing instead of letting them loose. It helps to save their missiles this way, as well as their health. Nothing has a life bar that you could just look at, so if you want to know the status of your allies, you have to ask them. What's your status? I'm in real bad shape. The controls take up the entire keyboard, and everything operates much smoother this time around. All of these keys take a little time to memorize, but aside from that, manipulating the capabilities of your spacecraft becomes second nature. You can play the game with a keyboard or a mouse and keyboard combo perfectly fine, but the real experience comes from using a flight stick with a keyboard. This allows you to maneuver and fire with one hand, and operate all the complex systems with the other. It's a better feeling overall, and I recommend this whenever you're playing any sort of flight simulation game. The missions in Wing Commander 3 take place in a vastly larger area than the previous games, simulating the true emptiness of space. You can still fly through it as before, but there can be a period of 15 to 20 minutes where absolutely nothing happens. Most people won't appreciate this, so the autopilot feature returns as a matter of necessity, and I really like this. It shows you a very short flyby sequence, and then gives you back control at a point when something happens. Reaching a nav point, an objective, or an enemy contact, whatever the case may be, you'll be taken right into the action. The space combat is only half the game. The other half takes place aboard the Victory, where you get to interact with all the characters in the game. You move around a ship like it's a point-and-click adventure game, and you can find people to talk to. These interactions are shown as FMV cutscenes. Unlike the animated sequences in the previous games, these are live action. I didn't know you and he had a history. Yeah, Thrakath and I've gone a few rounds. Seems to have a special nickname for you. It's news to me, Captain. An honor I could do without. The use of live actors allows them to exhibit their true personalities in such a way that ordinary techs could never provide. The characters in Wing Commander 3 are portrayed by Hollywood actors, including the likes of Mark Hamill, John Reese davies and Tom Wilson. Well, me, I, any chance I get, I'm up in the air. I mean, they're gonna have to pry my dead carcass out of the cockpit. Oh, stop banging your chest, you're gonna bruise it. The if those names don't ring a bell, shame on you. The game features an all-star cast of Luke Skywalker from Star Wars, Gimli from Lord of the Rings, and Biff Tannen from Back to the Future. 
idea. Oh man, I've dated all you girls. The FMV cutscenes do much more than tell the story. Some interactions give your character, Christopher Blair, two different paths for the conversation to go along. Can I help it if Confed decides to blank my data? He's got a point. What's he hiding? He's got a point. <laughs> Sometimes HQ is as big a mystery to me as the enemy. The choices you make in these cutscenes affect his relationship with the other characters, and this affects the game world. They affect the pilot's performance in combat, their willingness to follow orders. This can even change how some missions are played out. But most of the cutscenes are just that. Cutscenes. Sit back and enjoy. You also have a lot more freedom this time around when it comes to who or what you take on a mission. You can choose your spacecraft and configure the ordinance to your liking. You can also choose your wingman. Every pilot has their own flying style, so your choice will depend on the mission, but you also have to factor in your relationship with the pilots. They can be a liability if you get on their bad side, so you have a lot of options. Options are good. The missions themselves have a lot of variety to them. For the most part, you'll be sweeping nav points and clearing out the Kilrothi presence. This is the standard patrol mission similar to the previous games, but taking out the enemy is now a requirement. I like the idea of gathering intelligence instead of racking up the kills, but this change is not a huge loss here. You also have the typical search and destroy missions against enemy warships, and you have the escort missions which everyone loves to hate, but the ships you escort follow a preset path, so it's a non-issue here. Sometimes the game will throw you a curveball, Cutscenes can happen during a mission, and sometimes you have to make moral or logical choices here. But, as with its predecessors, your own skills as a pilot will determine the outcome. Nobody is a perfect pilot. You're expected to lose a few missions. Any mission can succeed or fail, and you play until you get to the end. Of course, the game comes to a halt if you die, but nonetheless, you have to play to win, otherwise you'll eventually find yourself making your last stand above planet Earth. There is a bright side to losing. Not begging for mercy from this furball. You get to choose how you die. Screw you. The new engine in general has done away with the limitations of the previous games. The graphics have a huge improvement here. Going from 2D sprites to 3D models means you can clearly see and target the individual parts of a ship. And this was one of my two complaints from the last two games. Landing on the ship is now easier than ever since you know where to land, and you can also use the autopilot feature to automate the entire thing. The perks from a newer engine don't end there. 16-bit colors, smooth frame rates, zero slowdown. This last point is especially important. The other big annoyance from the previous games was the slowdown. Time passed by slower when there was four to five craft in the area, and the controls became unresponsive because of it. This was also addressed, so you can enjoy the game without some technical limitation detracting from the fun. On the aesthetic side of things, the user interface and the 2D art is clean and crisp. You have a very detailed cockpit view to take advantage of the newer color depth and the resolution, but you also have the option to use a minimalistic view if you're interested in seeing more of the combat area. Damage to the cockpit becomes apparent with the glass cracking and the screen showing static when those systems fail. My big complaint is the artifacts in the FMVs. It sucks. The cutscenes were shot on digital video, and although the cost to record was significantly lower than using 35mm film, the technology was very limited. Storage space, resolution, and playback performance had to be considered. It's understandable that these artifacts are prevalent throughout the game, but it still sucks. If I were to nitpick anything else wrong with the game, it's the nebulas in the background. They look so cheesy when the camera's moving during the autopilot sequence. That's the extent of my complaints. The sound effects have a major upgrade here. The weapons have a more Star Wars-esque sound to it, and that translates to the feeling of raw power that you control with a pull of the trigger. The sound of locking onto a target and firing the missile, the sound of being tagged yourself, the voices filling the comms and making you a part of the game world. I love it. The explosions are louder, but they're still soft. 
It's an improvement though, I'll accept it. Same thing with the music, it's an improvement. The music transitions from one track to another depending on the current situation, and this helps to ensure the music doesn't get stale after a while. It's hard to describe, but it feels appropriate. Not quite something you would hear in Star Wars, but the music does its job. The overall look and feel of the game is simply amazing, and for its time, this was a game that got you excited every time you sat down to play it. God, I love that boy spunk. Wing Commander 3 put itself in the spotlight with its budget of approximately $4 million. This was unheard of at the time. By comparison, the most expensive game prior to this was Doom, $200,000. This was also a huge milestone for Electronic Arts. Wing Commander 3 was their first PC game to sell a million copies. It was intended to wrap up the war with the Kilrathi, a trilogy like Star Wars was before their prequels came out. But EA wanted more. They wanted another game, and they wanted it within a year. Chris Roberts obliged, but instead of churning out another game like Clockwork, he wanted to justify a proper sequel and the full price for it. So in order to do this within EA's timeframe, he focused on polished content and storytelling. He left the engine and the gameplay largely intact. The end result was Wing Commander 4, The Price of Freedom. Once again dropping bombs with its $12 million budget. This was originally slated for a December 1995 release, but the game was delayed by two months. The higher budget was mainly used to improve its production value. The FMV cutscenes were shot on 35mm film instead of digital video. They shot the scenes on 38 sets instead of extensive use of a green screen. The entire script was around 400 pages. By comparison, a typical two-hour Hollywood movie is around 120 pages. The fact that the cutscenes were recorded on film has also led to the game's re-release in DVD quality. The price of freedom is eternal vigilance. The story takes place a few years after the Kilrathi War. Piracy is running rampant, and a faction outside the Terran Confederation is on the warpath. Colonel Christopher Blair is recalled back into active service, where he's reunited with a few old friends from the previous game. The gameplay is similar to Wing Commander 3, but there are a few key differences. First, the most obvious, you no longer have a cockpit view. This may bother some of you who enjoyed the immersion it provided, but for the most part, it's a non-issue. You don't have to switch to different computer systems because most of the information is right in front of you now. You have more spacecraft you can play around with, and they also have alternate weapons. But just like before, you can choose your spacecraft, your ordnance, as well as your wingmen. I like the wider variety of missions you now undertake. It's similar to before, but they put a new spin on some of the missions. For example, the Paleus system has a jamming device that disables many of your vital systems like shields and radar, so you have to approach these missions in different ways. The difficulty was ramped up by quite a lot. This game is hard. I mean, really hard. A single missile can take you out, so you're just as strong or as weak as the enemies you fight against. Don't be afraid to tone down the difficulty. Some missions will show you leniency if you fail, but there's a few missions where you absolutely have to win. Ejection or failing the objective of these missions will lead to a sudden ending, discharge or capture and execution. So it's the same gameplay as before with a few minor changes but they have focused on storytelling here. There's much more interaction with the characters. All the major characters involved exert so much more personality than the previous games. Well, hooray. Guess that means we're gonna win this thing after all, right? <laughs> Welcome aboard, kid. Chief Tech Robert Sykes. <laughs> As usual, Maniac provides comic relief to an otherwise dark and mature story. How would you find there's some mind-baffling scenes that demonstrates Hollywood's lack of understanding of technology, like this scene where Lieutenant Sosa is decoding data on paper. Uh, well, look at me. I'm, I'm stuck in the Stone Age. I mean, so much of our equipment is down, I've got to resort to prehistoric tools in order to decrypt this info Captain Eisen brought with him. The clashes between Panther and Hawk help to pave the way for you to decide how the game will play out. 
Agreed, but hitting them first, I say we make the super base come after us. Do you have any idea what kind of force they can throw at us? Look, it's gonna be tough getting through. Sure, but using the flashback deliberately causing civilian casualties, that is morally wrong. The decisions you make and your ability to play the game will affect how the story unfolds. And this story is so heavily intertwined with the gameplay that you have to care about everyone. Besides all the characters involved, you have a stacked roster of pilots that are not really a part of the story. I assume they're in there in case you mess up your relationship with the other pilots, but I've never used them. At some point in the game, you take command of your own ship, and this gives you a lot more freedom when it comes to the missions you undertake. But as always, your own skills will determine the outcome. Just like Wing Commander 3, Wing Commander 4 was a game that got you excited every time you sat down to play it. It felt like a real sci-fi movie from the 90s, except you determine how the story unfolds. There's almost 4 hours of live-action cutscenes in the game. Put that together with a lengthy campaign with multiple branches in the mission tree, Wing Commander 4 is a game you will never forget. While there were no differences between the Mac and PC versions, the console ports had a drastically different feel to them for some obvious reasons. The 3DO port feels much more arcadey, and rightfully so. The controller simply won't allow you to do all the complex things you need to do to play the game properly. Even then, the controls are still confusing. You have to press specific combinations of buttons in order to do some basic things, like switching weapons and communicating with your wingman. It does support the 3DO flight stick, so you can alleviate some of the problems here. From what I can tell, everything has a much bigger hitbox, so aiming inside the red box is enough. And on that note, you're also more likely to crash into them. I've had this happen very frequently, whereas on the PC version, it's a rare occurrence. The game manages to retain an acceptable frame rate, but the planetary missions were replaced with FMV cutscenes because of memory restrictions. The resolution of the FMV cutscenes were also scaled down. The PlayStation version receives the same treatment, remove everything too large for the memory, and then scale everything else down. But aside from that, I feel it tries too hard to make everything work. The controls are worse than that of the 3DO, even though you have more buttons to work with. The combinations you have to press for every action is very difficult to memorize. You can do it, but it feels like a chore. The aiming with the D-pad is terrible. It's that accelerated aiming style, where your aim is moving slowly at first, and accelerates the longer you hold it down. You can't even tap the D-pad in the direction you want to aim. Communications is also very annoying. I can't hold the controller normally for this function, I have to reach over with my right thumb to hold down select, then I use the d-pad to use the com. This messes up the ergonomics of the controller, and it takes away from doing anything quickly. To their credit, they did one thing right here. Ordering your wingman to break an attack is bound to triangle, so the most frequently used command can quickly be issued. This port doesn't have compatibility with the official PlayStation Analog joystick, but this does work with some third-party flight sticks for the system. Same thing with Wing Commander 4. The PlayStation port has the only console port of the game, and again, the controls. They're a little bit easier to work with because of the options, but they're still very confusing and complex. There was still the issue with memory, but this time, there was also an issue with storage space. With the PlayStation game, the six CDs required to fit everything would become too expensive to manufacture, with all the licensing fees, restrictions set by Sony, and all the materials required for the packaging, so the content had to be scaled down to fit on four CDs. The Cersei series is missing, and the remaining planet-side missions were replaced with an equivalent objective in deep space. The FMVs were scaled down even more than the Wing Commander 3 ports to make sure everything can fit. But still, the big limiting factor of the console ports is the controller, not the machine itself. They still ran very well after the optimizations, and everything still looks somewhat acceptable. A for effort, but I would never recommend the console ports. The demos for these games were in two parts. You had an FMV trailer that repeatedly plays, good for showing off in retail computer stores. You press escape, you then get to try out the game. All you have to do is kill the enemies in the area, and then it goes back to the trailer. Not a whole lot to say about this. 
It only gave you a basic demonstration of the flight mechanics and the engine, which at the time was still in development. I never saw them on shareware websites, but this was on CD compilations included with PC magazines. I'm not entirely sure how effective the demos were, but we all know how well the games turned out. The Wing Commander games were very influential in not only its storytelling, but also in the way it's combined with the gameplay. There was real meaning to your actions, and the third and fourth games have aged quite well, so you can still play these games and have a rich experience. And unlike the first two games, Wing Commander 3 and 4 never had expansion packs. You buy the games, you had everything. But the base game still had so much to offer. Wing Commander 3 was one of the two biggest games to popularize the CD format. Wing Commander 4 showed the world what a video game can accomplish with a multi-million dollar budget. It's a shame Space Combat had died off a few years afterwards, but if you ever want to play Space Combat like it was in the 90s, I would highly recommend the Wing Commander series.